Welcome to Dolby Creator Talks. This is a show about how artists use technology to tell their stories, and I'm your host, Glenn Kaiser. So we are here doing a little something different to kick off 2025. We are in Las Vegas at the Consumer Electronics Show for 2025. This space is Dolby House and we are here at the Park MGM. This is a space that we've taken over to bring in artists and partners to talk to them about some stuff that we're excited about. So I wanna give you guys a really special behind the scenes look at what we're doing here because as opposed to the show floor over at the convention center, what we have here at Dolby House at Park MGM is not open to the public. So we're gonna go behind the velvet rope, show you some stuff that we're excited about. We talk a lot with artists about how they use Dolby technology, but we want to talk today a little bit about the technology and especially what's happening with Dolby Atmos in music, which is really taken off. And we're very excited about how the creative community has embraced Dolby Atmos music and how the automotive industry has embraced it and also how it's coming together in live performance at Dolby Live here at Park MGM in Las Vegas. So the big story for Dolby here at CES 2025 is really about Dolby Atmos music. So I am super excited to sit down for a few minutes with Christine Thomas, who is one of my colleagues here at Dolby. She runs strategic partnerships and industry relations focusing on music to talk to us about how Dolby Atmos music came to be and where it's showing up these days. Christine, first of all, thank you for taking some time to talk to us on Dolby Creator Talks. Pleasure. I'm so happy uh, here. So when we started Dolby Atmos way back in 2012, Brave was the first movie that came out in Dolby Atmos. I mean, I wasn't thinking about music. This was not a use case that we really envisioned at that time, or maybe some people did, but it wasn't on my radar. So tell us, just to set the context a little bit about like, how did Dolby Atmos become a music thing? And maybe like, who were the first people who embraced it? The creatives introduced us to Dolby Atmos for music. And that is, that is the goodness of Dolby. That is, that is how our ecosystem tends to work, as you well know. And so it began with some artists and some creatives who just fell in love with the technology and the promise that it could offer. And essentially they approached us and suggested that it could be incredible for music. And here are some incredible examples. And Rocketman was the first song that I heard, as so many of us did. Rocketman. The first time I heard Rocketman and Dolby Atmos just like rearranged my chromosomes because I just yeah. never, never thought about like, oh, this, the possibilities of yeah. this are amazing. It moved me. I mean, I'll just share it with you. It changed my life, not only from a role perspective, but just from an uh, understanding of what the experience could offer me the experience of music, the experience of the world. I really felt closer to the music and a song that I knew well, that I had grown up with. So it, it, it moved me on a deep visceral level. And that's what happened for so many people. And the creatives began to tell other creatives about it. And and they began to work with us on the tools and evolving the tools such that now there's an incredible ecosystem that supports from content creation to delivery. And they're educating each other in addition to the incredible education that we extend to the communities. It's a stunning, stunning um, evolution. Just tell me a little bit about uh, kind of the journey of getting Dolby Atmos into automobiles. You know, what's exciting, again, whether it's an artist or whether it's an automotive partner, and this is a very fair point, you hear the stories, it can take 10 years and, you know, they have very strong opinions about how they handle audio and they're excellent at it. They are world-class experts at it, each of them. And so as we shared the experience with car companies and the individuals who are leading them, the brilliance that, that those engineers bring to the table, they reimagined their own environments again and again and everyone has their own fingerprint just as any artist does so does a car manufacturer so you get to have this incredible immersive visceral experience whether you're in a cadillac or whether you're in a rivian or whether you're in a polestar and that experience is it it maintains creative integrity but it also allows for that car company to imprint their own sound and then i get to enjoy it on the 405. And it's also not just necessarily about music. I mean, we've got Dolby Atmos showing up in places like podcasts, which yes. is really exciting. Podcasts and AV content is coming to the car, and we're really excited about what we're seeing happen in China with that, that experience as mm -hmm. well. Lee Auto is a terrific partner adopting you know, Dolby Atmos and Dolby Vision. So we're thrilled at the evolution of this experience, and we're thrilled at, um, again, the ability to extend it to our, our many um, not only our partners, but our consumer contingency. And when I'm thinking about auto, I'm thinking about the 21 car companies that have announced just in the last 
four years and I'm thinking about the many environments that I've been in across the gamut of models, I'm having this thrilling experience that I know every one of my friends can also have. Maybe for people who don't necessarily know where do, where do they get a Dolby Atmos music experience today? Absolutely. On over 3 billion devices <laughs> is my very proud answer. iPhones or Androids, um, speaker systems all over the world, uh, tablets, televisions, and again, cars, sound bars, you name it. Well, I've really appreciated all your help and your partnership, especially on our, our work on education, because you talk about artists breaking it. And what gets me excited is about, you know, like our partnership with the John Lennon Education yes. Bus. And then you get young, you know, emerging music artists coming in and they're thinking differently about it because they're creating natively in Dolby Atmos. They're not trying to relearn. Yeah, how they to make don't have yeah. any rules to abide by. They don't have any preconceived opinions at all. They're exposed to a tool set. And for them, it's just a palette, right? I mean, truly, it's just all the tools and all the potential, and we learn so much from them. So obviously, we extend our education beautifully, and the work that your team has done is just stunning. I love that it's accessible in whether you want to read it or watch it or listen to it, and or whether you want to attend a university or another educational institution. Um, so many of our partners, of course, are extending it. But what's really exciting, too, is to watch the students start to, you know, teach, I want to say, share with more. Uh, Evangelize to each other, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Their passion and the opportunities. And again, there are no bounds. So to experience the evolution of music with them, that's thrilling. Christine, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us on Dolby Creator Talks about what's happening with Dolby Atmos Music. I'm excited about these cars. We have some of the cars here in Las Vegas at Park MGM, so let's go check that out. All right, we're in the Polestar 3 electric SUV, and Polestar is bringing Dolby Atmos Music to the masses as part of their branded audio experience through Bowers & Wilkins. This is a 25-speaker system streaming through Tidal Music, also enabled through Audible. And this is a preferred experience for a lot of our music industry partners as it really highlights creative intent and translation from the studio to the automobile. Polestar 3 electric SUV streaming Dolby Atmos music. We are checking out the brand new Cadillac Optic, listening to some incredible Dolby Atmos music with their 714 AKG system that comes standard in the Optic. It's got 19 speakers. It's just a really incredible experience. So we've shown you a little bit about how Dolby Atmos music is showing up in the device and in the automobile. But the other thing that I'm super excited about showing you here in Las Vegas is kind of the ultimate embodiment of Dolby Atmos music. And it's the live experience at Dolby Live at the Park MGM in Las Vegas. This is a 5,000 seat arena, which is equipped with Dolby Atmos and some of your favorite music artists are performing in Dolby Atmos live. And I'm joined by Mark Tuffy, who helped put this system together and is gonna to talk to us about it. So tell us about this room and your role in kind of putting this together and kind of how this fits in the whole Dolby Atmos story. Yeah, so how this fits in the Dolby Atmos story, really this is where fans come to connect to the artist, right? You know, when we're, we're talking about people hear the music on Apple Music or Tidal through their cell phones, they have the opportunity in the cars to listen to content, but really here, Whit and Dolby Live is like this where fans connect to the artist and emotionally. And so here we have about just over 400 loudspeakers we've put in here um, to give you a, a great Atmos system. And the goal that we had in here was that it doesn't matter where you are in the room, you should have a great experience. Normally, when you come to a concert, the closer you are to the king or the queen you pay for. Um, but, the, but our philosophy was it doesn't matter whether you're here on the floor where we're sitting or up in the balcony up there, you should get a great experience. So that was the goal in creating an amazing Atmos experience for everybody in the audience. So I, I know when we started putting together Dolby Atmos music experiences in live spaces. It started off kind of as an EDM thing, really. Yeah. So, but you are crossing all different kinds of musical genres in here. So just give us a sense of like, who are some of the artists who performed in Dolby Live and Dolby Atmos? Yeah, you're right. We started off in, in EDM and we really sort of expanded out. So we've worked with people like Aerosmith, uh, Usher, or is the one that probably people know, know the most. Just now we're working with Maroon 5, incredible relationship with them. I've obviously had Imagine Dragons in here. Mariah Carey is performing here just now and, and coming up to you know, sneak preview. We're doing Motley Crue. There's a couple other people I can't talk about just now, but uh, we've, we've had a ra wide range of people. It's not just EDM music. Right. People would think EDM is relatively easy for Atmos, right? Because you can program stuff, but we've done everything from Santana, which is really, he has like 
I think it's 2,000 songs, I think it is, that he has, and he picks every single song and you don't know what's going to happen. So the team has to really run on the fly to a very choreographed show. So we've done everything from country, we just did Cody Jinks, Mariah Carey, sort of R&B, you know, you have Maroon 5, you know, sort of pop rock, then you've got Motley Crue coming, sort of, you know, the 80s, sort of glam metal. So it's a huge change of different genres of content. It doesn't matter. Dolby Atmos can work for any type of content that you've got. One of the questions that I had for you is, like, certainly in the in the cinema world, mm -hmm. when we're talking about Dolby Atmos, we've certainly seen, like, it's been around now for a decade plus. Yes. And one of the things that we've seen is, like, the first kind of few years of Dolby Atmos mixes were basically, like, 5.1, 7.1 mm -hmm. mixes that then people kind of went back into and they added stuff to and they kind of, kind of opened up. But then... A couple of years after that, people really started to mix natively in Dolby Atmos and really start to think differently about storytelling through sound. So is there kind of a similar thing with, with music? It's, it's interesting. With, with music, it's uh, I'll go for live music, seeing as we're, we're sitting here in the bowl, so to speak, um, in the pit. Um, with live music, it's, it's very different for them because they have started off thinking about this dual mono element to begin with. But what we found is that people have made this incredible leap. Um, with cinema, we had the advantage with Dolby Atmos. We went from stereo to 5.1 to 7.1 to Dolby Atmos. Here we're taking people from essentially from dual mono. To, yeah, to, yeah. Right. So it's a massive leap conceptually for them. But it, the interesting thing is the front of house engineers have made that leap conceptually themselves. So they've, it, of course, every front of house engineer and act is unique and how they want to push the technology is different. But we have seen people go completely crazy right from the very beginning. Some people that are conservative because it's an artistic choice. Yeah. So it's been, we thought at the beginning it would be similar to the way it has with cinema, but actually it's been, it's been quite different because they've suddenly had this tool to try all these crazy things in this space and feel very comfortable because in a lot with Dolby Live as well here were residencies. Mm -hmm. So they can feel a little bit more comfortable because it's not a one and done show. So they can try something out and then go, oh, okay, maybe that did or didn't work. So the next day, I'm going to try something different. They have that advantage. So they're tending to push it a little bit further because they have a safe space that they can try it. In. Oh, that's interesting. So wh what you're saying is that like they're actually evolving and changing and, re and, and recreating the stuff as they go through their residency. Every, every show that we have that uh, each day we generally, the, the front of house engineer comes in here and they're like, I want to do this a little bit differently or I want to do this a little bit differently. We, our system can of course be completely connected to time code because there's a lot for the front of house engineer to do. Right. So I've designed it so that they can do things however they want, but we've pretty much found that for almost every show, people are evolving and changing things as they go because they find things that, oh, I want to try this differently. How about if we do this? How about, you know, for Usher, it literally was he would come in every single, almost every day and be, Kyle, why don't we try this? Yeah. I'd love to try this. And with Maroon 5 as well, Maroon 5 is a really interesting example. Some of the band have Dolby Atmos Studios at, at home. home. Yeah. So they're literally coming here now and saying, I want to split up my guitars differently because we can do these really interesting things in the studio we can now bring here. Yeah. So you're seeing the evolution that as people are getting used to doing it more for uh, music and recorded music, it's then affecting the live performance, which is great for the artist, great for the audience. Yeah. So give me a sense of like when a new artist is coming in to Dolby Live and they're going to perform in Dolby Atmos. Like maybe, for instance, talk about Usher, because mm. I saw that show. It was yeah. a pretty amazing experience in, yeah. in, in Dolby Atmos. So when you have a new artist that's coming yeah. in, like what's the process for kind of getting them up to speed on mm. performing in Dolby Atmos and how much of it, like how much of it is kind of prepared ahead of time and how much of it is live in the on the fly? So kind of take us through that that. Yeah, Usher, Usher was an interesting one, you know, um, sometimes you have artists who've worked a lot in Dolby Atmos and sometimes you have artists that don't. And so that's one of the first things is that we, we try and understand, has an artist and his team worked in Dolby Atmos? Have they produced content for the streaming services in, in Dolby Atmos? In that case, sometimes... And that's probably team, easier, right? If they've had some experience working is, in Atmos before and then you bring yes. them in here and then it's basically just, let's do it live. It is. You can take a lot of that content you worked on in the studio and actually use it here which is a very cool thing. So we've had people that have, have done that, but some people haven't, they're just trying it out. So Usher as an example, it was a, a case where we actually went to uh, LA and worked with the team there and we actually brought them up to speed. Education is a big thing. This is still relatively new, right. uh, immersive audio for, for live. So we brought the team up to speed 
taught them about what Atmos is. Cameron, who's up here at the, the back of my team, actually went there to the rehearsal space, worked with Kyle Hamilton, the mixer, amazing, amazing mixer, uh, who worked on the Super Bowl with, with Usher, and uh, brought them up to speed with what Dolby Atmos and what the opportunities were. Because remember, it's a tool. Right. And it's a creative tool for people to use. So it's helping people understand that and getting over their concern about what does it actually mean. It doesn't change their music. It offers the opportunity for them to do new things. Mark, this has been amazing. I love, I've seen shows in this space. It's stunning. I really appreciate you taking the time and talking to us about Dolby Atmos and Dolby Live. Well, thanks so much, Glenn. And uh, I really hope that people have the opportunity to come here and see a show. I've been fortunate enough to see a few and it's an amazing experience. All right, everybody, thanks for joining us today for this walk around at Dolby House at CES 2025. We're really excited about everything that's happening with Dolby Atmos Music, whether it's on your device, in your car, at Dolby Live. So I hope you go out and have a Dolby Atmos Music experience of your own very soon. Thanks for joining us.